evening. evening. Welcome to Holy Cross, and thank you for being with us today as we observe the 21st Sunday after Trinity. We're getting ready for Reformation Day next week, but today we have, I think, an exciting topic for our scriptures and our sermon, and that is the whole armor of God, which St. Paul counsels us to um, take up in conflict with the evil one so that we can withstand in the evil day, the day of temptation. So uh, that will be the focus of our message this evening. Um, I do have some additions to our prayer requests. Well, one addition, that is Lexi Chase, who is a friend of Galen Conklin's. Lexi is uh, suffering from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and is undergoing chemotherapy. So uh, we'll pray for Lexi and include her in our bulletin prayers from here on out uh, as she continues this struggle. Um, I apologize for some, uh, some date mistakes on our bulletin. Um, this week at Holy Cross, on the back of the bulletin, it's not the 17th through the 24th. It's, uh, what would it be, the, the 23rd through the 30th. Um, so Reformation Day is not on the 24th this year. Um, and same thing on the inside of the bulletin um, serving us in today's service, 23rd and 24th, not 16th and 17th. Um, I would ask if anyone is aware of any additional announcements that need to be made this evening. If not, I think we're ready to begin with our opening hymn. Number 668, rise to arms with prayer employ you, and we will rise for our opening hymn. And 
sinners, all my fear are shaken. The saints with joy will greet that day. Praise God, our triumph's sure. We need not long endure scorn and trial. Our Savior King, His own will bring to that great glory which we sing. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The whole world is in your power, O Lord, King Almighty, no one can gainsay you, for you have made heaven and earth, you are Lord of all. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your just decrees are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness give me life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The whole world is in your power, O Lord, King Almighty. No one can gainsay you, for you have made heaven and earth. You are Lord of all. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, keep your household, the church, in continual godliness, that through your protection she may be free from all adversities and devoutly given to serve you in good works. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our scripture reading. The Old Testament reading for the 21st Sunday after Trinity is from Genesis chapters 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind, on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their times, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, 
and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done, so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the Holy Gospel. Gospel according to St. John, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that, that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed, and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess together our holy Christian faith according to the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, 
begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for our hymn of the day, number 666, O Little Flock, Fear Not the Foe. Peace be unto you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this evening is our epistle lesson for the 21st Sunday after Trinity, from the epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians, the sixth chapter, where St. Paul encourages us Christians to put on the whole armor of God. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Christ Jesus, 
Why would the Christians of Ephesus, to whom St. Paul is writing, need to put on the whole armor of God? Why might they need to prepare for the evil day, make themselves ready for attack by the evil one? Well, of course, every Christian through every age has to be concerned with attacks from the devil. But in Ephesus, this was uniquely felt. In Ephesus, there was a great shrine, a great temple to Artemis of the Ephesians. This was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, an impressive edifice that would fill with awe those who saw it. Tourists would come from all over the world to catch a glimpse of this architectural marvel, and they could bring home with them a little silver shrine souvenir so they could continue worshiping Artemis from home. Why the worship of Artemis? Well, it seems that this Artemis worship involved a meteor or something that had fallen from the sky, and the heathen of that place set the location of this rock from the sky as a shrine to a divinity from on high, viewed by them now as Artemis. And Artemis herself is depicted in the statuary as having the signs of the zodiac around her neck to signify that she was in charge of the heavenly authorities, the principalities and powers of the heavenly places. She oversaw them all. She was responsible for the fertility of the community. She was responsible for governing the magical practices of the Ephesian heathen. She was a force to be reckoned with. And she was very much in the mind of the heathen of Ephesus when St. Paul was going about his gospel ministry in that city. In fact, what led to St. Paul finally having to hightail it out of Ephesus was a mob that was accompanied with the chant, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And the worshipers of Artemis saw St. Paul and his gospel of Jesus Christ as a threat to the rule of Artemis. Well, as it turns out, Jesus Christ and his gospel were quite the threat to Artemis and her reign because, as St. Paul says earlier in Ephesians, Jesus has been set far above all heavens. He is enthroned above every principality and power in the heavenly places. It is not Artemis of the Ephesians, but Jesus of Nazareth who has all of this authority and can protect his Christians from the assaults of these evil forces. And these evil forces were active, they were at work, they were palpably felt. You may recall that when many of the heathen of Ephesus were converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ, they held a bonfire at which they burned their magical books. Yes, they had written spells through which they could call upon these authorities, these principalities and powers in the heavenly places, and get them to do their bidding to the harm of their neighbors and to the advantage of themselves, Artemis being chief among them all. But now the Christians know, even though we are under assault by Artemis and the powers at her disposal, who are really just a screen for the devil, for Satan and his minions, even though we are daily under assault by them, nevertheless, the Lord Jesus is in charge of everything, and he has power to protect us from it all. But he has power that we need to appropriate to ourselves by faith in him and by immersion in his word. That's the situation in Ephesus. Does that situation continue for us today? Well, we don't have that many visible idols around us today. We don't have that many people who 
outwardly worship the signs of the zodiac and, and use magic, as far as we know, to harm their neighbors, though, I mean, who can say what goes on in secret under the cover of darkness? But I can say that the Christian church in this place, in this time, does experience the threat of the power of the evil one, which St. Paul says is at work in the sons of disobedience, the enemies of Christ's church. How do we experience today in this time and place this opposition to Jesus, to his church, and to his saints? Well, we experience it on a larger societal level through a number of attacks, I'll go through just some of them very quickly, and I invite you to chat with me one-on-one -on -one if you'd like to delve more deeply into these matters. And I see all of these attacks, and I'm just going to highlight three of them, I see all of these attacks as aimed against this statement made in our Old Testament lesson from the creation account. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. Again, I see three main forms of attack that our Satan-ruled world makes on the Christian church and upon us. This is critical race theory, which we hear a lot about in the news these days. Also, uh, the attacks on human life that we see in abortion and euthanasia. And finally, the attack on marriage and on relations between male and female with modern gender theory. All of this has just taken our society by storm in recent decades, and the attacks seem to be ramping up. With critical race theory, we're being taught that if you're born white, you naturally are an oppressor, and you can't do anything about it. You just have to keep silent, do the work of learning about how racist you are, and give up whatever power you might have in our society. If you're born black or in some minority group, then you are hopelessly oppressed. There's nothing you can do to get out from under that oppression. You will always be under the thumb of the white oppressor class, and there's nothing we can do about it until we completely demolish and rebuild our society, including the Christian church. This is very different from what you might call classical views of racism and civil rights. The idea that black and white are equal and we should get along and we should be kind to one another and dwell with one another in peace. That's not the goal of critical race theory. Critical race theory rather stirs up dissension and is very destructive. Again, we can talk more about that one-on-one -on -one if you're interested in following up on it, but I will say this is an attack on the image of God in man. This is an attack on the truth that we are all of us, children of God, created by him after his own image and likeness. We are not created by God in the categories of oppressor and oppressed. We are all in his image and likeness. Then, of course, we have attacks on human life itself in the form of abortion and euthanasia. In Genesis, uh, later in the account, when we have the flood of Noah, and Noah and his family come off the ark, God institutes capital punishment, and the reason he gives, he says, man is made in the image of God, and so if you shed the blood of man, by man must your blood be shed. We're made in God's image, meaning that our life is sacred. No other human being has the right to take your life away, because that is a sin against God, in whose image you are created. Of course, abortion takes away the life of the child in the womb. Euthanasia takes away the life from the sufferer later in life. All of it attacks the image of God in man. And isn't it interesting to note that in this Texas abortion law that's been in the news lately, one of the most vocal opponents of that law is the Church of Satan, which literally has an idol to Baphomet, the goat-headed devil, in Michigan. And their opposition to this law has been welcomed by the political forces 
that seek to enshrine abortion as a national right. We really are fighting against the principalities and powers, the authorities in the heavenly places, the powers of the evil one, again, gunning for the image of God in man. And finally, we have modern gender theory, the idea that there is no true such thing as male and female, that gender is a a societal construct, and as expressed biologically, it exists on this spectrum, all kinds of strange stuff that I won't get into, but what it's gunning for is God's institution of marriage through which he has blessed us to be fruitful and multiply over the face of the earth, and the truth that to be made in the image of God is to be made male and female, and as male and female, as man and woman together in our integrity, we bear the image of God on the earth. All these attacks, I say, are against God's initial creation, what he made us to be, as human beings in his image. And one of the most striking things about these attacks is that the result is to silence us, to silence opposition. Have you heard of cancel culture? If you publicly say the wrong thing, if you say anything that calls into question the tenets of critical race theory, if you say anything that goes against the sacred right to abortion and euthanasia, if you say anything to call in doubt our modern gender ideology, what will happen to you? You will be canceled. You will be scrubbed from social media. You will be fired from your position. You will be cast out of polite society. It's happening over and over and over again, and the effect is people like me are much more reticent about speaking out than we would otherwise be. And that's one of the devil's main goals. He wants to silence Christ's church. That's not even to get into the individual text that the devil makes upon us as Christians by tempting us into sin, enticing us into iniquity, drawing us away from Jesus Christ back into the darkness from which we have been called. Yes, we are every bit as much in need today of the whole armor of God as were the Ephesian Christians when Paul wrote this letter. So what is this whole armor of God? How did the Ephesian Christians stand up against the attacks of the evil one that they experienced through the cult of Artemis of the Ephesians? And how are we Christians supposed to stand up against the forces of darkness as we encounter them in our society, in our culture, and in our own individual lives? We put on the whole armor of God. What is this armor, and where do we get it? We get this armor through our baptism into Christ. When we are baptized into Christ Jesus, we put on Christ. Christ becomes our clothing, our garment. We receive his righteousness. We receive his strength. We receive the forgiveness of our sins. We receive eternal life. We receive eternal salvation. We are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And all of that gives us boldness and confidence to go about the tasks that God our Father has sent before us. When St. Paul speaks of the whole armor of God, he's speaking in a different way about what it means for us to put on Christ in holy baptism. I also need to emphasize that putting on Christ, putting on the whole armor of God, does not mean you undergo a ceremony at one point in your life and then for the whole rest of your life, you now have this armor and you're just fine. No, this needs to be something that's part of the daily practice of the Christian. I cannot help but think of Martin Luther's counsel when he advises us on daily prayer in the small catechism. When we get up in the morning, we are to make the sign of the Holy Cross, the same sign made, up, made over us in our baptism in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, 
in whose name we are baptized. We make the sign of the Holy Cross. We thus appropriate to ourselves once more, intentionally anew, the blessings promised us, given us in our baptism. And then what does Luther have us do? Repeat the creed, the confession of our faith, and then the Lord's Prayer, our faith in action, seeking good things from God our Father, including deliverance from temptation and from evil. Finally, Luther has his own little prayer that you can pray if you want to, which includes a prayer for protection against the evil one provided by God's holy angel. And then he says, go joyfully to your work, singing a hymn of the Ten Commandments or something else along those lines. In other words, you go out in boldness and in confidence and you live the life that God has called you to live and you live it with his word on your lips. How does that work itself out in the form of the whole armor of God? Well, first of all, we start by fastening on the belt of truth, which is to say we gird up our loins with God's own truth. Now, girding up your loins is something that a lot of us might not quite understand the way the ancients did. I haven't worn a dress in a long time. And probably even the ladies among us don't typically, don't that often wear dresses that go all the way down to your ankles. I could be wrong in some cases, but you know, I do have this advantage of having these skirts, you might say, that I wear whenever I conduct public worship. And I can tell you, it does not work to run in these vestments. In fact, sometimes if I really need to take care of some kind of business in the middle of the service, get myself to the hole and get myself back, I will actually pick up my skirts so I can run a little bit better. Well, the ancient people all had skirts going down to their ankles, men and women alike. And so if they had to be really active going about working in the fields or at the Exodus, when they knew that God is going to send them out of Egypt quickly that night, they needed to have their skirts permanently pulled up. And the way they did that was they girded their loins. That is to say, they picked up their skirts and wrapped a belt around their waists so that they could move unhindered by those skirts. Girding up your loins means you're ready for action. And what makes us ready for action as soldiers of Christ Jesus? The truth. God's truth. When the devil tells a lie, we respond with God's truth. When the devil tries to convince us of falsehood, we hold to what God has taught us in his word. And the first and primary great truth for us Christians is that Jesus is Lord. He is the Lord our God. He is the Lord, the authority over all forces in heaven and on earth. And he alone is our righteousness and salvation, our deliverer from sin and death. We have no power of ourselves to accomplish our own salvation. That privilege belongs to Jesus and to Jesus alone. That is the core of his truth, and it is in that truth that we gird up our loins and get ready for action as the Christian church. Then also, we put on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is Christ. That's what it is to be baptized. We receive from God the gift of righteousness that is Jesus Christ, who covers our iniquities and grants us the righteous status we need before God so that we can be saved everlastingly and enter with joy into his kingdom. Notice the breastplate goes all around you in terms of the whole armor of God. It's the thing that would come closest to an all-encompassing robe. It's something that enfolds and closes you and keeps you safe from the most deadly strokes of your opponent. If we have the righteousness of God, nothing the devil does to us can hurt us. Even if he destroys our bodies, 
our souls remain in the care of Jesus Christ. And when our bodies are raised on the last day, they will be raised imperishable to inherit the kingdom of God with the saints in light. The righteousness of Christ that is ours in holy baptism is our breastplate of righteousness that protects our lives from every spiritual assault. And then, having girded up our loins and put on the breastplate of righteousness, we put on our shoes. Now, my kids like to go all over the place barefoot, but there are certain times when they recognize they really need shoes. In particular, in our backyard down below a, a, at the base of a hill, we've got this swing set up that William especially loves to be pushed on. But he knows he can't go down there barefoot because there are pine needles everywhere. And if he does try to go down, he steps very gingerly. But if we put on his shoes, especially his current sneakers, which give him an a superhuman ability to run really fast and jump really high. When you put on those shoes, he's ready. He's ready for anything. No hesitation running out into the yard or anywhere else. When we put on the shoes of the gospel, we are ready. Our feet become the beautiful feet of those who proclaim good news who come preaching the gospel over the mountains. We are not to be silent. We are not to be intimidated by the evil one and his attacks. We are to speak freely, openly, boldly, confidently, because we have the truth of the gospel. And if we are confident about the truth of the gospel that Jesus has entrusted to us, his church, that is as if we have put shoes on our feet so that we can step out into a hostile world without hesitation, with boldness and confidence. The devil cannot silence those whose feet are shod with the readiness of the gospel. Then, in every circumstance, we take up the shield of faith. Now, it is interesting the way the shield of faith functions in St. Paul's illustration. He says that the shield of faith is there to quench the fiery darts of the evil one. Maybe you've seen those uh, movies set in antiquity or in the Middle Ages when the, the core of archers fire their fiery arrows. I think especially of one of my, uh, my favorite movies, the movie Gladiator. In that movie, the Romans have all of these arrows that they dip in pitch and then they light them on fire, and they rain down fire on the opponents. Well, the devil for us is pictured here as shooting fiery missiles at us, fiery darts, fiery arrows. And if they hit us, we're in trouble. At the very least, we're going to experience a measure of anguish. Now, when I think about what these fiery missiles might be, I think of some themes from earlier in this epistle where St. Paul speaks of the sins in which we once walked, the passions and desires of the flesh. The fact is, the desires of our flesh, the ungodly sinful desires of our old nature which we are to put off in baptism, those desires, when the devil stirs them up, do have the sensation of fire, of pain, of burning, of anguish. In fact, in a different epistle, in his first epistle to the Corinthians, he speaks of the particular desires that may afflict those who are not able to seek refuge in marriage as burning with passion. Yes, the fiery darts of the evil one can bring about great pain and anguish as he inflames our natural sinful desires, but in holy baptism, Jesus has given us the shield of faith. Faith that counts God as real and as an ever-present help in trouble. Faith meaning we don't simply view God as an academic exercise, as something we 
think about in our minds, but God is someone real and awesome who is with us, who is present right there with us and is observing us. And when faith recognizes how real and present God really is, those desires have a way of being quenched and falling away. Imagine your shield being taken up from the baptismal font. It is drenched in baptismal waters. And when those fiery missiles from the evil one, our passions and sinful desires, come toward us, we set that shield between us and the devil's deadly missiles, and as they penetrate the surface of that soaked shield, they are quenched. The water puts them out. They have no power to harm us. The exercise of faith in Jesus Christ quenches all of those passions and sinful desires. Then we take up the helmet of salvation, also given to us in holy baptism. We are confident that no matter what happens to us in this battle, even if the devil should overcome our bodies, nevertheless, we have salvation in Jesus Christ. Deliverance in this age from the sins in which we once walked, but also deliverance in the age to come from death and hell itself. We have the promise of resurrection and life everlasting in God's kingdom. With the helmet of salvation, we know no harm can ultimately come to us. And finally, we have the sword of the Spirit. Now, this is where our appropriation our wearing of the full armor of God cannot simply mean remembering our baptism and living in our baptismal faith. There is something else that we do as Christians that equips us for this daily battle, and that is meditation in the Word of God. Because the sword of the Spirit is, Paul says, the Word of God. The Word of God, of course, is the Scriptures all that he has said to us, his church. Now, of course, you are meditating in the scriptures right now by being present here, gathered with your fellow believers to hear and learn God's word. You are being equipped with his word and you will leave stronger than you came with the sword of the spirit mighty in your grasp. However, I hope, I dearly hope, that your exposure to the Word of God is not limited to what we are doing here today. I hope that your exposure to God's Word comes in the form of daily reading and meditation of God's Scriptures so that you can learn them inside and out. The fact is, no matter how many sermons you hear and no matter how many Scripture lessons you hear read, it's only ever going to be the tiniest dose of God's word. There's so much more to his scriptures. He has so much more to say to us than you can receive here in church. And so if you're not already, I urge you in the spirit of St. Paul, take up your scriptures and read them and daily learn them and grow in them. Make it a daily habit to read through your Bible. Read it cover to cover and then start reading it again. Familiarize yourself with its contents Commit to memory those passages that are especially striking to you and beneficial to your walk of faith. Make the scriptures your daily meditation and you will be equipped with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Also note that a sword is an offensive weapon. What do we do with this sword? What do we do with the Word of God? Well, when the devil speaks... Through his minions, the son of disobedience in this world, we are ready with an answer because we have been instructed in the word of God. The more you know God's word, the more confident you will be to speak, to respond to the gainsayers, to bring God's truth to bear in your confrontation with the powers of darkness. That's putting on the whole armor of God. It's remembering everything that God has done for us in our baptism. And then in that baptismal faith, taking up the word of God, being instructed in it, and being ready with the gospel of peace 
speaking this word to others without fear. Don't worry over much about being canceled, about being ostracized from social media, or driven out from your circle of friends. You have the readiness of the gospel. You have the sword of the Spirit. And whatever form the devil's attacks may take, whether it be out there in public, in the civil realm, or whether it be in your own conscience, or whether it be a matter of stirring up sins and evil lusts, whatever his mode of attack, whatever the stratagems he uses to draw you from light back into his darkness of death, we're ready for him. And why are we ready for him? Not by our own strength, but by the strength that God supplies, by our baptismal faith and our daily walk with God and growth in his word. May the Holy Spirit stir us up now and throughout our Christian walk to clothe ourselves daily with the whole armor of God, to do valiant battle with the devil in whatever form he may take, and to endure in our faith unto the end. For Jesus is our righteousness, Jesus is our salvation, Jesus is our victory, and at the last, Jesus will be our peace. He is our whole armor of God. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We rise for prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the faithful proclamation of Christ's saving name, that God's people may be strengthened in their true faith and his kingdom extended, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the holy Christian church throughout the world, and for all who confess the name of Christ, that God would guard and defend us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our flesh, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, its mission, and its people, for the ability to meet the needs that arise as we do the work God has given us to do, and for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the schools of our society and for the educational institutions of our synod, for our preschools, our day schools and high schools, our colleges and universities and our seminaries, and especially for our own Trinity Lutheran School, that those who teach and those who learn in them would be preserved from all harm and danger of body and soul, and transformed by the wisdom and truth of Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who partake this day of Christ's holy body and blood, that in their eating and drinking they may receive the benefits of forgiveness of sins and their renewal of life, and have a foretaste of the feast to come, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who have wandered from the faith, that the Holy Spirit would use us to call them home to the Father, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our government and all who have been set into positions of leadership, that they may use the authority entrusted to them honorably and for the good of their people, to the maintenance of righteousness and to the hindrance and punishment of wickedness, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who suffer from hunger, homelessness, poverty, or unemployment, that God's great mercy and love would preserve and relieve them, and that he would make us the vessels of his mercy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the faithful, that the Spirit would lead them to cheerful, generous giving from the bounty the Lord provides to support the church and to help those in need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are sick or are in any other form of need in either body or soul, especially Lexi Chase, Pastor Bob Bartell, John Bloom, Liz Davis, Doug Griman, Alan Hendrickson, Sherry Holmes, Doug Lefevre, Ashley Moeller, Susan Needham, Kathy Perry, Janet Sable, Jean Sperry, Tyler Stevenson, Sheila Taylor, Tyler Wentler, and Brian Yance. That God would grant healing to their bodies, and until the time of their deliverance and healing, strength to bear their infirmities with patience and grace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
for our homebound members, for Barb Davis, Liz Davis, Adeline Dodds, Mabel Philbrandt, Betty Gronbeck, June Schindler, and Joe and Jerry Spoo, that God would keep them steadfast in his word and holy faith, and bring them safely together with us all to the joys of life everlasting in his kingdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who rejoice in the rich blessings of God, especially Judy Griman, Sophia Berkmeyer, Galen Conklin, and Brian Kramer, who celebrate birthdays this week, also Rick and Teresa Bracker, who celebrate an anniversary this week, that they may always remember the giver of every gift, and give him heartfelt thanks, and that as he has blessed them in time past, so he would bless them in time to come, and bring them safely through continued faith in Jesus to the imperishable blessings laid up for them in his kingdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the gathering of the offering. We rise as we continue with the service of the sacrament, page 208. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks to such grace. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love, shown to us when you sent your only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, into our flesh, and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabbath, adored, heaven and earth with full acclaim, shout the glory of your name, sing Hosanna.
Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may be faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Christ, true Lamb of God, you take the sin of the world away. O Jesus Christ, true Lamb of God, have mercy on us, Lord, we pray. O Jesus Christ,
rises, sing the Nunc Dimittis, page 211. O God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 664, Fight the Good Fight. We'll remain standing for our closing hymn. quickly that um, we do have an announcement in the bulletin concerning the commemoration of the faithful departed that takes place the week after Reformation Day at our uh, Observation of All Saints Day, uh, where we take time during the service to speak aloud before God the names of uh, those among us who have departed this life to be with the Lord. That doesn't have to be limited to members of Holy Cross. 
If you have a loved one who is not a member of this congregation but was a Christian that you would like to have remembered in that, uh, in that time, please contact the church office so that Vivian can collect the necessary information and include it in the bulletin. So uh, thank you for being with us this evening. God grant you a blessed week this coming week for Jesus' sake. Thank mm-hmm. you.